One of the major pitfalls of doing SETI searches is the need for confirmation of candidate signals. Any candidate signal must be independently verified for it to have legs as a serious contender for a signal of alien origin. The problem is, this has never happened in the entire history of SETI. No confirmed signal of potential alien origin has ever been found. But non-repeating candidates do exist, along with a problematic one that actually did repeat. So this is a rather tricky implication. It's possible that aliens may not see the need to repeat their contact signals because they send signals that are so unambiguous that anyone that picks them up will recognize them as such. And we might be missing such signals because, well, one detection just isn't enough for us. Here we have to delve into the perspective of an alien civilization using ourselves ultimately as a guide. We now know about thousands of exoplanets, but the study of exoplanets in depth has really only just begun. We're in the earliest phases of characterizing exoplanets, and we literally have centuries of work ahead of us in getting a handle on a sizable sampling of the exoplanets of the Milky Way. As we do this work, which really begins with the James Webb Space Telescope, we will no doubt find surprises in all manner of odd planetary situations that we've never seen before, because examples don't exist in our solar system above and beyond confirmed types like super-Earths that we lack. But we'll also see exoplanets of types that we recognize. There are probably many analogs of Venus in the Milky Way, for example. And we already know Jupiter-like gas giants are common, especially the so-called hot Jupiters. But what we may well find as well are examples of Earth-like worlds. Planets that show strange oxygen and methane disequilibriums that strongly point to active biospheres on those worlds that could be every bit as complicated as that of Earth, or some other atmospheric makeup that only life could account for that's so weird we haven't even envisioned it yet. As a result, these worlds, even if they do not show technosignatures, will become targets for SETI to listen to, and will be the best targets for METI should we ever decide to make a serious repeating attempt at messaging alien worlds by radio. But here's the problem. We have no plans of doing that, and any intentional signals we've sent out were number one, unambiguously technological in nature and intended to be decoded by a recipient, and number two, never repeated. Our own behavior tells us why aliens may only send out one-off signals, and that we shouldn't expect confirmation or repetition of candidate signals. And here's where we run into interesting things hidden in the annals of the history of SETI. When one asks the question, have we ever seen a signal that repeats, but bore the narrowband hallmarks of technology that was never shown to be terrestrial interference? Yes, once. And it promptly fell through the cracks. In 2003, a signal was detected that behaved really strangely. Known as radio source SHGB02 plus 14A, the signal was near the 1420 MHz hydrogen line that SETI favors, but was very, very weak. Nevertheless, it was observed to repeat three times. But strangely, there was no candidate star system for the source that was known. It came from an area of the sky that's unusually devoid of stars, located within a thousand light years from Earth. The signal drifted in an odd way, suggesting that if it originated on a planet, that planet was spinning 40 times faster than Earth. It was argued that these unlikely circumstances ruled the signal out as being anything, despite the notion that aliens might not be located on a planet, but might be crossing interstellar space in a spacecraft that's spinning like ours sometimes do and their signals might be weak, just like ours tend to be. But it's still possible that the signal was an instrument glitch, as it almost always started at 1420 MHz and drifted from there. But that's never been pinned down, and the equipment doesn't seem to have ever done it again. On the other side of things, sometimes anomalous signals are discarded because they're too strong and never repeated. A good example here is the signal TYC1220-91-1, this signal was outright very close to the mark. If it would have repeated, it would have made perfect sense that it was a signal of alien origin. This signal was at a very suspicious frequency, exactly where you might find a beacon signal saying hello. The frequency was pi times 1420 MHz, and it was coming from a near twin of the sun, but a bit older. 
But what was odd was the strength of the signal. It was 300 sigma above the background. That's galactically speaking screaming from the rooftops, and in comparison, the very strong WOW signal was only 30 sigma, and represented the strongest signal the Big Ear radio telescope ever picked up in its decades long run. So at that power, TYC 1220-91-1 needed to repeat, and it never did. And there are many more. Another set of cases from the history of SETI involved the megachannel extraterrestrial assay, which was backed by Carl Sagan and partly funded by Steven Spielberg and the Planetary Society. It started operations in 1985 and continued for years until the radio telescope collapsed in a storm. Over the course of the study, they identified 11 still unexplained radio signals. The interesting thing about these signals was that they were all narrowband and near the hydrogen line or a multiple of it. Where that while none repeated, they did correlate somewhat strongly with the galactic plane, suggesting that the signals were real and astronomical in nature. But that's as far as those signals ever got and none have repeated. And this problem is even worse when you look at other signals the Big Ear radio telescope detected across its run above and beyond the WOW signal. These signals were numerous and came from all areas of the sky. They weren't particularly strong, but they were narrowband near the hydrogen line like you'd expect for a technological alien signal. The problem is, out of the numerous examples detected, they never repeated. The point is that there have been many, many one-off signals in the history of SETI, and they continue to be picked up, and none of them repeat. But our own signals that we've intentionally sent out at a power that aliens could detect never repeated either. So it pays to ask the question, what if aliens just don't repeat their signals often? This is very possible and there are two problems here. The first is that aliens may simply not want to put the energy into frequent contact signals with candidate exoplanets that they know have biospheres, but are uncertain as to whether there are civilizations on those worlds. We're in this boat. We do very little that aliens could detect, and anyone further than 100 light years wouldn't know we exist. But they might know Earth exists. It's been screaming its biosignatures for billions of years. And the aliens might take a shot in the dark every now and again and pulse a series of signals out, in hopes we might catch one. The other problem is that we really don't know what time scales aliens operate on. They may see it as perfectly reasonable from their perspective to only send a signal once every hundred years, where we would probably operate on a much faster time scale if we were to send out a repeating signal. We just don't know. And after all, how important is it for an alien civilization to announce its presence constantly? Probably not very. But regardless, it may make more sense to send out singular pulses. And if you do that, you want to pack it with information. We've done this. The famous Arecibo message consisted of a stream of data that could be reconstructed into a simple picture. The problem is that when the designers of that signal had other scientists try to decipher it, no one managed to do so. So is there a way to create an unambiguous signal that if anybody happened to pick up, might easily be able to decipher it and know that someone else is out there? The answer is yes. And there is one somewhat chilling aspect to it that certainly gives me goosebumps. More on that in a bit. There are a number of approaches you could try, such as pulsed prime numbers or other unnatural looking features that could make for an unambiguous singular detection. But most SETI experiments aren't really designed to decode signals, but rather simply detect them, and also see if there is modulation. But as far as deciphering a message, we really aren't equipped for that because it's very unlikely we'd be able to figure it out. But aliens may anticipate that, and may not think exactly like we do when sending out signals. They may choose to do something so simple as to describe an aspect of nature in such a way that it can't be a natural radio signal. One idea here involves the 1420 MHz hydrogen line. The reason this is considered a good place to look for alien contact signals is because it's the frequency at which hydrogen emits radio in the universe, and any alien civilization practicing science on a level high enough to figure out how to build a radio telescope would know about it. This is the basic region of the spectrum where cold hydrogen clouds are radio visible. But hydrogen has another signature when it's hot. 
It's called the Lyman series, and it's the spectrum of hot hydrogen. So here's how you can construct an unambiguous radio message announcing your presence using a description of hydrogen. You place your main signal at or near the hydrogen line as a signpost. Then from there, you step up in frequency showing the Lyman series spectrum as a representation in radio spikes and signal strength. Voila, that can't be a natural signal. The Lyman series is in ultraviolet, not radio. And it's already in a language that anyone in the universe with science will understand, so long as they get a clear interception of the signal. And get ready for the goosebumps. We may have picked up just such a signal, and it's our old friend Wow. Here the strong signal was just above the hydrogen line, right where it would be expected, represented by the famous 6EQUJ5. But look closely at the computer printout. There are other numbers Dr. Eamon circled that were significantly above background and step up from the main signal. These look to some like a part of the Lyman series. Now two, possibly three data points are not a good statistical match for confirming that's what this is. It could have just been noise, but it is odd. And had we been able to observe the wow signal in its entirety instead of just 72 seconds of it, if a complete Lyman series appeared above the main signal, that would have been it, aliens. The signal could not reasonably have been natural because one, it was narrowband and looked technological, and nature only has a limited few ways to produce a narrowband signal, and second, it was at the hydrogen line as expected, and third, it pulsed out a radio representation of a spectrum, and nature is just not statistically going to do that. Nature could be reasonably ruled out in this case, even though it's a single detection. Unfortunately, the wow signal was never observed again and was partial, and we didn't see the whole signal because the big ears beams moved with the Earth's rotation because the telescope was not steerable. But we do know that the signal was sidereal. It moved with the stars and not as a satellite or plane would. The signal fit the big ears antenna pattern, which means it had to be at least half the distance to the moon away. There were no satellites in that area at the time. It was not comets, that hypothesis did not stand up, and WOW has stood the test of time. If it were complete and did represent a description of hydrogen, then that interpretation likely would still be standing today. So while WOW had no modulation and no message within it, it was just raw radio energy, any source out there saying that there was a message in it is a hoax, the real message would have been in the frequencies involved. And the message simply would have been, this is how hydrogen, the most common element in the universe, behaves when it's cold. And this is how hydrogen behaves when it's hot. Hello. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently celebrating something rather interesting. Event Horizon's first Nobel laureate scientist recently joined me for a deep discussion on the nature of dark matter. Dr. Frank Wilczek comes out Thursday. And I'd also like to announce a new third channel, JMG Clips. Link below where there'll be bite-sized clips of the most interesting bits of the Event Horizon interviews, but also miscellaneous special content that doesn't fit on either of the channels that both I and Anna, calling herself Air Knight, will be doing, including live streams. It's going to be fun, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.